Today is the first day of this December 1983 seven-day retreat. Before starting working on a koan, a few words about listening to a talk. you've heard comments like this umpteen times, is it possible not to tune out at this moment, but to listen without remembering, without interpreting or comparing? Interpretation or comparison immediately activates memory and then that's where one is and the words that are actually spoken and what is actually pointed at passes by passes by this enclosed memory chamber So can there be an open listening without expecting to hear this or that? Without expecting, just listening. And at the same time, looking and listening inwardly, because what is talked about is never some story of thousand years ago or somebody <coughs> out there, somebody else. It's always me, myself. Can one listen in that way that what is being said may be relevant for looking into and understanding oneself in action or in inaction? It may be difficult to hold the same posture for the 50 minutes or so that a talk lasts. It's not necessary to hold it. One can change the position of the legs. If you do it, can it happen quietly, attentively? So the rustling of the clothes and creaking of the joints doesn't disturb the neighbor. Also, there is a rest period before this, this morning sitting and talk. And if one is tired from the night before, having slept little or poorly, it's a good time to take a rest. Because it can be quite an agony to, to be tired during a talk. Or the tiredness may suddenly disperse because one sees something. There's tremendous energy in that. Tiredness may be an attitude of thinking, while well, she's speaking to everybody but me. That's thinking, that's this windowless thought chamber. But one can step out of it. It doesn't have to be there. The koan, the title of the koan is Gute Raises a Finger. It's number three from the selection of the Mumon Khan. I'm reading from Zenke Shibayama, but here and there some other translations come in. Again, you may have heard this koan before, maybe many times before, here or at other centers, read about commentaries. 
it's possible to drop all this past knowledge and, and listen freshly so you'd never heard it before The Koran reads, Master Gute, whenever he was questioned about Zen, just stuck up one finger. At one time he had a young attendant whom a visitor asked, What is the Zen your master is teaching? The boy also stuck up one finger. Hearing of this, Gute cut off the boy's finger with a knife. As the boy ran out screaming with pain, Gute called to him. When the boy turned his head, Gute stuck up his finger. The boy was enlightened. When Gute was about to die, he said to the assembled monks, I obtained Tenryu's one finger Zen. I attained Tenryo's Zen of one finger. I used it all my life, but could not exhaust it. When he had finished saying this, he died. The commentary says, The enlightenment of Gute and of the boy attendant are not in the finger. If you really see through this, Tenryu, Gute, the boy, and yourself are all run through with one skewer. And the poem reads, Gute made a fool of old Tenryu. With the sharp knife, he chastised the boy. The mountain spirit raised his hand with no effort, and lo, the myriad piled high mountain was split in two. Master Gute, Master Gute, whenever he was questioned about Zen, or here it says, whenever he was questioned, just stuck up one finger or held up one finger. There's a biography to Gute, which is maybe interesting to know. He lived alone, hermit-like life in a hut in the mountains. doesn't say what he was doing, but probably concerned, deeply concerned with becoming enlightened or finding out what truth is, maybe having an idea by sitting to free himself from life and death, whatever that meant. He was sitting and sitting alone in a mountain. And one evening, a nun came into this hermitage, disregarding all formalities of greeting, taking off hat, her hat, just walked around him as she came in, and asked him to say the right word, which he couldn't. And he had no word, he was just baffled. And she did this two more times, and. No word came out. What am I going to say? What does she want me to say? When she was about to leave, he said, wait a minute, don't leave, stay. So she said, say the right word and I'll stay. And again, no word, right or wrong. So she left. The 
the, this is the bare bones of the story that has come down to us. Can one feel one's way into Gute there in his hut? Trying to solve something, to find something. And then this woman coming in and humiliating him in a way. I'm not saying that this was her intention, but this is how it may be received. She knows something that I don't know. Keep asking me. What a shame. Everybody else seems to know except me. One wonders in what spirit Gute was left, whether it was really this humiliation that we feel so often when we can't do what we're expected to do, and all old seen scenarios of having been humiliated and shamed come rise up. The pain of that, the anger and resentment connected with it, the impotence to do something about it, except to creep into this image of being no good. That's one escape left. And it's an escape, because then one doesn't deal with the situation of really not knowing. One doesn't even call it stupid. Stupid is already an escape because then I am somebody. At least I'm stupid. <laughs> and with this goes all kind of thoughts and, and roles and one can dump the burden of oneself onto others. make them feel bad, sort of try to elicit pity and oneself wrapped up in self-pity for not having what it needs or what it seems to need. One doesn't know. <coughs> One doesn't know what is even the question of having anything. There's so many assumptions we ride on a platform of assumptions through space. We don't see this space. We're just oppressed or supported by all our assumptions about ourselves and human nature and the world and people and certain people. And all of that is just ideas, memories, thoughts with the connected network of emotions which manifest physically and give us a hard time in the form of pain and discomfort, tension, too much adrenaline or too little. So what state was Gute left in? We don't know. The story doesn't say. Maybe it did say something about praying. Let me see. It says, Gute was now greatly ashamed of himself. This is what Shibayama says. I wonder how he knows. Because Oriental cultures, I just recently saw a, chi a, a movie about China in which shaming is the predominant way of dealing with crime, even mental sickness, probably the whole education, the, the, force, is sh the force of shaming. And I was told that it is very similar in Japan. Children are not hit or punished, they are shamed. 
into conformity, into obedience. This whole thing of the expression of losing one's face has come to us from China. And we do it too. By comparing one child and another, see how nice Johnny is, or how good your older sister is, or how nice she eats, and look at your mess. <laughs> says, Gute was now greatly ashamed of himself for having been unable to give an answer to the nun. He made up his mind to leave his mountain hut to visit various great Zen masters, have further training to open his Zen eye. According to the legend, that night he had a dream in which a foreigner told him that a great master who would be his teacher would soon come to the hut. In accordance with the dream, Gute decided to remain on the mountain. Sure enough, ten days later, an old monk came by. He was Master Tenryu. Gute was convinced that this must be the master the dream had foretold. I wonder how we know all this. <laughs> <laughs> who, who was the recorder of this, the biographer? It's what, because everyone is at liberty to, to invent. And if one realizes that these are inventions. Most of us, one knows oneself. How one tells a story, it's already not quite accurate. One has invented a little bit. <laughs> Make it a little bit more lively. <laughs> one hasn't listened completely and substitutes one's own feelings, how one would have done it, or, or has misheard altogether. So beware of believing in any scriptures. They're man and woman made. But we believe that either God or some great teacher wrote them down. Teachers usually haven't written anything down. It's their disciples who do. With all the inevitable distortions. Gutai was convinced this must be the master the dream had foretold, and he welcomed him with reverence. He told Tenryu of his encounter with the nun and asked him what the fundamental word of Zen could be. Tenryu, without saying anything, just stuck up his finger, and Gutai was enlightened. One doesn't know the state of mind of, of Gute. Was it a state of not knowing? Of total perplexity? Not knowing which way to turn? Or to go on sitting, what to do? And yet not giving up? Not throwing in the towel? Or Just, just allowing that state of utter perplexity. To be. Allowing energy to gather in that, not knowing a way out or in. And then we hear this next generation story in which Gute had a boy attendant. I've heard it mentioned it often. At the age of four or five already, children were turned over to a monastery at that age, probably not with their consent. What is consent anyway? <coughs> One does what one thinks is right, and that comes through the tradition, through the parents. 
So he'd been there a long time and watched this great master raise his finger all the time. Apparently, it's what, apparently all he did. <laughs> There's no, no tape library for that. <laughs> just raising his finger whenever he was questioned. The boy sees that. He, he takes it in from the first day. He witnesses it. And that's it, as far as he's concerned. Raising a finger. Question it, you raise a finger. He'd no doubt about that. One can say, well, he imitated he imitated the master. And in that case there would be the motive, I want to be like my master. I can do just as well as he does. If somebody asks me, I don't have to get all the way to his inner chambers. I can tell him. <laughs> but the whole the way the story unfolds doesn't seem to point to that. Creeping as it were inside the skin of this boy, he believed this was it. This is the truth. Buddha holds up a flower. Gute raises a finger. That's it. And somebody asking, questioning, that's it. His, his whole life and belief system there at the monastery was that finger. Because the, the great master did that all the time. So at one point, having done it again, probably having done it many times, we don't know, word came to Gute about this and he sent for the boy. Boy came. Was he feeling guilty, like an imposter? I doubt it. He just came in, in all innocence. He hadn't done anything wrong. And Gute cut off the, the finger. Just try to see what, 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 what is happening here. Gute cut off everything for this boy. Everything, everything that the boy had, since he was little, thought was right and was the truth and was it and was Zen. The teaching, the holy teaching, the tradition, Gote probably mentioned before, if he mentioned it at his death, he probably mentioned many, many times how he received this from Tenryu. Maybe he didn't. We don't have to stick with the story, but how is it when all of a sudden everything is cut off? Has it ever happened to one? Everything that one holds dear, believes in, which is one's life, one's security, one's foundation is gone, finished, cut off, unavailable. Then what? Maybe the loss of a religion due to circumstances, one thought or another. 
may be the loss of a person. Loss of a the closest companion one ever had. A person dying or leaving, leaving to be with someone else. Or getting sick, growing indifferent, just not being there anymore. And that person was one's life. One didn't realize it at the time, but now that he or she is gone, there is just nothing except shock. And after the shock, indescribable pain, lostness, cut-offness, What happens in a situation like this? He had says the boy screamed with pain. Just that, just it wasn't even pain. I don't know what it, what it is to lose a finger, but it's not the finger. It's to lose everything. No footing, nothing to hold on to. Nothing. And then what do we do? Can, we, can one be that, be with that? completely or is immediately the search for the next branch for the next foothold for the next relationship all for an image of what one is a loser which is an escape it's also a refuge or the activity with the anger, or the resentment, or the self-guilt, all of this is escape. Can it be seen as such? Not labeled, but just seen that it is escape. It's not that original pain anymore. It's away from that, into something more gratifying or more entertaining. And I'm not saying one must now wallow in the pain. It's not a wallowing. It's there. And the, the perplexity of why, but not, not looking for guilt. Where, is it proper, where can it properly be assigned to this person or that person or to me? Just not knowing totally at a loss of understanding. And yet, with this total thing, the whole thing, as it is, not labeling it as it is, but being with it as it is, and the breathing or the who or the moo or what is it? Here in this case, Gute called the boy, the boy looked back, and Gute raised a finger. It's in this state of innocent perplexity, loss, not knowing that something new took place, something new was seen, which had never been seen before. The boy had never seen the finger, only the idea of the finger. And it was this idea of the finger that he was perpetuating, 
with visitors. This statement at the time of death of Gutes I used it all my life, I used it all my life, but could not exhaust it. died. What is it that's being used? Who's using it? What is it? This finger, which is always new, this, this instant, which is always fresh, what is it? Not the memory of it, not the anticipation of it. Can that all be cut off? In the who or mu, or what is it? Not repressing pain or, or fear. Not repressing, allowing everything to be there. When it's there and not holding on to it when it's gone or anticipating it when it's not there. Why is it so arduous to just be nowhere? Not the idea of nowhere. It's all thinking. Who or mu? Is that a thought? What is it? Is it thinking? Or is there this, this vast openness of not knowing and therefore in touch with whatever may or may not be there? without escape, without clutching. Without the image of now I am really getting places, then that's again thought. But it can be seen and dropped immediately and just who or mu, what? Without any refuge, in any images, in any hopes, to say, oh, do you mean then this whole thing is hopeless? It's an idea. Hope is images projected. Who and where am I? What is it when there is no image projected? Everything cut off, taken away, dropped. Useless, old hat. Says he in the commentary, the enlightenment of Gute and the boy are not in the finger.
are not in the thought, not the idea of enlightenment, making that the goal of one's efforts. Goal already is idea. Do you see that? It's not what is now. Of course, you can say, well, the idea is going on now. Yes, <clears throat> as long as the idea is there now, one is not in touch with what's actually happening. The idea shields it, screens it all out. Being in touch is not knowing, no words for it. If you really see through this, Mumon says, Ten Ryugutai, the boy, and you yourself are all run through with one skewer. Which is just that which we said yesterday night. No, no separation. No me and not me, or me and you. You being better or worse than I am. It's all thought. Do you mean to say I shouldn't think? That's more thinking. What am I to do? What am I to do? I don't know. I don't know. be listening, questioning what is, who or what or more, which are not things, they're just the expression of not knowing. An energy gathering in this who or more. Koan, the poem says, Gute made a fool of old Tenryu. With one sharp knife he chastised the boy. Because he did not chastise the boy. Chastise means punishment. The boy hadn't done anything wrong, so there was no need to punish him. He did what he thought was absolutely right. There is nothing to this finger. It can be cut off because it whether Gute really cut it off or not, we don't know either. Some Zen teachers claim he didn't, others claim he did. It's not the point here. With a sharp <clears throat> knife, with one blow, the whole existence was shattered existence of belief, me, mine, it, gone. Poem continues, the mountain spirit raised his hand, or maybe just one finger, without effort. And lo, the myriad high-piled mountains split in two. This refers to Chinese legend where the country, countryside was wrecked with drought, it was, nothing was growing, people were starving. 
and then this mountain split and water, the Yellow River, came through and inundated the fields and rice grew again. Everybody had plenty to eat. The myriad high-piled mountain, I think everyone sitting can tell what this refers to. Always another thing on top of it. This mountainous me. All the ideas about oneself. And the world. It's the pile of, of old stones. Can it crumble? Is it even real? Who am I? No. What is it? Not, I'd like that mountain to crumble, but what is this imprisonment? Not battling with it, just leaving it be and questioning right there. Questioning is totally free. It does not depend on location or condition. It doesn't depend on anything. It's free. Just who? Or more? Or the breathing? Breathing without knowing what breathing is? What is it? I have no words for it. No goal I want to attain through that. Just, just listening, just the listening and the breathing and the attending being one whole thing with no one wanting something from it. And if the someone reveals himself or herself, can one see it at one glance and the breathing goes on? And the image drops away. We'll stop here for today.